Hello, and welcome to an intro to Anthro with two humans. I'm human number one, John McRae. And I'm human number two, John Lear. And this is the podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of this episode is, Please Don't Touch Mumblings and Musings on Museums. Fantastic. So, <laughs> I knew we were headed this, the train was going to pull into this station at some point. I I think you actually brought this up a couple episodes again. You said we need to talk about museums. Yeah, so I think because this is what your your episode. Yeah, oh well, thank you. Uh, so yeah. if we win the uh, Webby or whatever it is, <laughs> I I'll make the accept, acceptance speech. Okay, I'll just stand behind you and just smile and, and nod. <laughs> yeah, with your arms behind your back. <laughs> Oh, we we got to get a whole bunch of people up there. If we, <laughs> yeah, that's if we true. Get a webby. I could get Just my a... family. I don't know who else we could get. I don't yeah. know. We put <laughs> we put out an invitation. <laughs> Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, first of all, I know you have a lot of art in your house. You could see some art back there. Yes, yes, we do. There's a piece there that I used to hate. That one behind me. Uh, really? And and now I've totally fallen in love with it. At first I was like, who would, they're just painted squares. And yeah, now, yeah. Uh, 20 years later, I'm like, God, I love that thing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think happened? What, what was the, you? Well, I just started noticing different things, the way the colors were laid out and the, yeah. the play with symmetry and, and all that stuff that people who understand contemporary art know. But it, for me, as a idiot from Kansas, it took me, I had yeah. to learn grassroots, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of art in my in my house. My wife is a MFA, and uh, her her father is an art dealer. So yeah, tons of art. It's constantly moving around, which is sort of disconcerting. Like you'll yeah. come into a room, and this painting that's been there is no longer there. Now it's in somewhere <laughs> else. Well, it's like it's like a museum gallery. Then exactly. like you're constantly changing the uh, the exhibit. It is, just puts me on it. edge, though. I don't you know I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> My mom set up my house and like a museum and left it there. Yeah. My entire everything was in the same place <laughs> from the beginning to the end. Was your mom like that? Well, you guys yeah, moved yeah. a lot though, too. We moved a lot, a but it would usually be set up exactly in the same <laughs> same configuration exactly. when we got to the new place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the pa- the pictures behind the couch were always in the same order, you know. Exactly, the that's the way I grew up too. But uh, no, <laughs> not not my current living situation. Do you, uh, because you're surrounded by art, do you consider yourself to be an art guy or a, a museum guy? Uh, not really. I mean, I've always loved museums, but I've basically yeah. you turned me on to the museums, and I'm talking about, you know, the w- weird museums, the museums <laughs> that, uh, yeah. you know, that are out there. Uh, but no, I, it doesn't. Well, you know what? Now that you mention it, the room I'm actually broadcasting from today. Uh, yeah. Because my family is asleep, we're we're pumping this baby out uh, for Christmas on Christmas Eve because <laughs> we are professionals. Uh, but the two of us had to get up so early to do it that I had to move into this room, which is like our grand room. I have one of those rooms in my house that no one's allowed to go in. Yeah, and that's the yeah. room I'm in now. The carpet's white. It's really? the biggest room in the house, but nobody hangs out in here. Yeah. Do you wipe your feet before you went in there? I don't want you getting in trouble. When you... Everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid yeah. of this room. It's beautiful, but yeah. nobody goes in here except, I yeah. don't know, when we're entertaining. Right, you know? right. Yeah. White carpet makes a statement. I'll say yes, that. it white does. Carpet, white carpet yeah. says, don't fool don't, around. Yeah, don't mess around in here. Yeah, if I had yeah. to pull out your spleen, this would be the room to do it because it's <laughs> totally clean, you know? <laughs> Uh, you mentioned, I know you were just recently in Austria. Did you, did you go in Austria and Berlin? Did you go to art museums there? I went to one museum. I believe I sent a picture of you on the outside, which was yeah. a, uh, the, the winter or summer palace. I think the summer palace right. of the, uh, emperor, which was incredible. And you would have loved it. I mean, it was just all of these rooms. Cause what happened was each emperor would set up their they would just take a part of the of the of the you know palace for their yeah. apartment you know and they've <clears> left <throat> all of those so you kind of it's like walking through time yeah, uh, yeah. So you go through the different apartments of the different emperors and see how they set it up yeah it's like your mom's house 
<laughs> it was probably very comforting for you. Yeah, it was. Through there. <laughs> yeah. But it, it really was, my God, the work and just the, oh, my God. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that I went to the Holocaust Memorial, but that's not really a museum. Right, uh, in right. Berlin, which was really because we we I went uh, performed in Berlin as well, and um, uh, but that yeah no not the same uh, not the same experience at all. Was that all outside, or did they yeah. have any lit- like literature, or any text that went along with that, or was it all just they have? It's this. It's this. It's amazing <clears throat> if you if you've never seen pictures of. I mean, it's it's hard to describe. It's this huge space filled with these monoliths that are all the size of a their grave grave right, the size of a right. grave they're rectangles that are at different heights so it's like this kind of city of graves and it's undulating the ground so you can go down and up and right, it's hard to right. explain but then <clears throat> there's an entrance into a whole underground underneath it that has is where the museum is, but the we were there on Hanukkah and it was closed. Um, yeah, or when we were there, uh, so I didn't go in there. But it, I hear it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, you know, behind uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, there's a Holocaust memorial too. Really, and it's also one where you go down, like you're yeah. on the the island in the middle of Paris, and you go down to get into it, and the walls are really high. Yes, and it's that's just what this such is a, like. Such a visceral feeling of being hopeless. Hopelessness. Yes. Yes. In there. Yeah. So. It's so well done. <clears throat> if you're ever in uh in in Berlin, you got to check it out. Cool. Um how about the you're right near the Hollywood Wax Museum. Do you ever go down to the I have never been in Well, <laughs> wait a minute. I feel like maybe I have I've never been in it, but I've walked by it a bunch of times because anytime anybody comes to visit, they all want to yeah. do the Walk of Fame, which I'm always down for. Because yeah. it's it's not what people expect because it's full of junkies and urine and trash <laughs> and it's all and which yeah. I always say to people is like this is what Hollywood is the Hollywood the Boulevard of Broken Dreams right. you know this right. is this is this is what real Hollywood is yeah um, but yeah it's oh my god but the problem with the wax museum is that out in front are these people and you you know these people who dress up like spider-man <laughs> yeah, or batman yeah. or they try to charge you and they're super aggressive and scary and sketchy yeah um yeah. and so i try to avoid that that area i've always i took my uh sister and my mom and my nieces one time they were really little and we went to uh Grauman's chinese theater and it was yeah. the same thing there was a guy dressed yeah. like uh spider-man Right, but but it was it was it, yeah, it was like his pants crunchy. are soiled. His <laughs> yeah. pants are soiled. He hasn't washed. He's a broken down actor who yeah. hasn't washed it in forever. Not wearing a cup. It was, it Not was wearing. Like, yeah, exactly. It was like a little exactly. like a, just grab my nieces and like let's keep going. Let's yeah, go, keep going, keep, keep going. going. No, don't stop for a picture. Don't stop for a picture. Yeah, and he always grabs like a, a lamp pole and gets up yeah. like three feet off all the ground, holding on a lamp pole and and making like the Spider Man pose. That's his yeah. thing. I I also love the Walk of Fame because there's always people in there who were at the top of their game you know, at this point, like 175, 100 years ago. So you'll see, and you have no idea who they are now. So it'd right, be like, right. oh, the star for Adolf Manju or something. You know, <laughs> just people, he was like a top star at one time. And now nobody Anybody even... can get a star. You just pay for it. I'm going to get you one. I'm going to get you one. I don't know what the emblem, they have an emblem on each star that says what area, what genre, really? film, television, yeah. whatever. So I don't know what podcasting would be, maybe a computer <laughs> screen or something, but I'm, I'm going to get you a, I'm going to get you a podcast. I'm sure star. it's out there, right? I'm sure they have to. There's, I mean, you yeah. gotta, I mean, in somebody. If you pay for it, if you pay for it. Yeah. Oh. It, that's the way Hollywood is. You pay for it, you get a star. Uh, didn't you at one time. Was it at an art gallery or you saved somebody's life at a at an art gallery is, or a show or something, right? That is absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, it really is. I was – my father, as I mentioned, my mm. uh, father-in-law uh, is a art dealer and he deals – he's kind of a private dealer, uh, yeah. heavy-duty stuff like Picasso and I can't think of any of the others. Anyway, yeah. big big-time art dealer. And, um, he, but he does it, he would have a show every now and then he doesn't really do it anymore, but he'd have a show from his house. 
So we turned yeah. the entire house into a gallery. <laughs> and yeah. um and and people loved it because all these rich people would, you know, feel special. And uh, yeah. you know, I think it was a good move on his part. Anyway, he he would have the, you know, his family work it. And I was the new son-in-law. And so I was in charge of the Beatrice Wood uh, uh, bedroom. There was a, yeah. one of the bedrooms was turned into Beatrice, who's a potter and this amazing stuff. Anyway. Um, and I'm in there just kind of standing in the corner like you do. Uh, and these people are talking and they're eating. Um, and this woman starts to choke. And 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 I hear it. I yeah. hear it yeah. seal. You know where it's at. Yeah. You know where it's oh, like, and God. and it's sealed in there. You can tell. Yeah. And she's making the I'm choking motion with her hand on her right. neck and right. and her arms out, arm out. And um, her friends, all these wealthy people, all took a step back away oh, from her. God. They didn't know what to do. They just they, yeah. They, yeah. They, they they choked. Um, yeah. and I don't know what made me do this. I, 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 I went up and I gave her the Heimlich. I'd never been trained to do the Heimlich. I'd worked in many restaurants and in the employee yeah. bathrooms of restaurants, they always yeah. have, uh, the Heimlich poster there. So maybe I'd seen it right. while I was using the restroom over the years. And I went up and I grabbed her from behind and I popped her sternum <laughs> and a piece of beef came oh, flying no. out of her mouth and she grabbed it. <laughs> that was the weirdest part of the whole thing is she caught it. She wanted to say the artwork. <laughs> Just, well, at least it would make it classy. If you're going to chill, make it classy. But there was a doctor who kind of came in right when I was making my move. Yeah. And he was like, she was dying. He he was like, that really? was, a, yeah, really? she was going to die. And so I saved her life. Wow. And, <laughs> and she knew it. But yeah. here's the thing. No tip. Really? Didn't buy one piece of art. <laughs> just thanked me. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That amazing? You think she could buy something. But I, I, like a you could just slip me a 20. <laughs> you know, I yeah. saved your life. And right. I was broke at that time. I was, I mean, well, yeah. you know, but yeah, I was, you know, I could have used it. I saved your yeah. life. God damn it. Yeah. But nothing, 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 in the nothing. Not even if and, 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 in the and, tip jar. <laughs> well, yeah. And my understanding is, is that she is my slave now for the rest of her life. Yeah. Yeah. But nothing. She's never called. She's never stopped by. <laughs> never asked if I need anything. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Did you did you get her contact information? Like, hey, by the way, I'm going to need your. Like, no, your, I felt your... that was on her. I mean, I yeah. saved her. I did my part. Right. right. The least she could do was Google me and find my address and stuff. Yeah. Maybe it's time to reconnect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to be like, hit yeah. her up at uh, hit her up. I could track online. her down. Yeah, I could track her down. She's on Carl's uh, on my father in law's mailing list. I'm sure. <laughs> like. Maybe if you hey. have to go through and check them all, you know, check the like <laughs> the signature book and be like, well, "Hey, were you at yeah. that? Hi, Did you choke were on you me? by any chance?" <laughs> <laughs> I need some help. I need some help right now. <laughs> um, and then you finally get her, and she's like, "Yeah, like something." <laughs> yeah, 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 you yeah, would know immediately. And, yeah, you know immediately when you mention that she would be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so John, as you know, I, I kind of consider myself to be a museum guy. I, you are, you are a specialist. <laughs> I will say that right now. I've worked at a couple museums. I worked at the Spencer Museum of Art as a guard, uh, years ago be. in Lawrence, Kansas. And then I spent many years working as a guard at the O'Keefe Museum yeah. in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's why, and your <laughs> wife has benefited from all that imagery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know you what you're look. doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of time on your hands just to think uh, about things. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Yeah, uh, in the no, winter when no one's in the galleries, you like, just stare <laughs> oh, at it. Oh, Jesus. Just yeah. stare at it. And Wait think. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> if I put my tongue there. Yeah. And John, uh, you also know uh, I've taken some museum studies courses, graduate yes, level. You have. Museum studies courses. Not only that, but your wife has a museum at your house. <laughs> yeah, the Share Museum out back. The Share Museum, so. which if you're ever in the Albuquerque area, I highly yeah. recommend you stop by their uh, their she cave and and yeah. check it out. Yeah, 
by she appointment shall. only. By appointment, yes, by appointment <laughs> only. <laughs> we don't want to. <laughs> don't want people just going out there and looking at it. Uh, and then also, you know, I, I've gotten into, I love going to museums, for example. And yes, I also, I like going to big museums like the Getty or, you know, the Louvre, all that. Mm-hmm. And then I, I also- the Louvre with you. I know. I was thinking yes. about that when I was putting this together. Remember when we were at the Louvre? We, I still we got- owe an amends uh, to a baker uh, uh, there because I stole us some croissants. We were so broke. We were so broke. Yeah. That would be a hard one to get a hold of. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, I think I, I'm going to – next time I'm in Paris, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find him. I'm going to do yeah. it. Yeah. I remember when we went to the Louvre uh, – Remember, we got there early because we wanted to go see it. I think I wanted yeah. to go see it. I don't know if you wanted yeah, to go I was, see it. I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were broke and hungry. I know. I know. But we decided to stop and get some drinks beforehand before we went in the loop. <laughs> we had like three hours to go before they closed. And we we're like, well, let's have a couple beers before we... And then I remember we looked down at our watches. It was like, we have 30 minutes. <laughs> we had been in there for like two hours drinking. And then, so we had to run over, and I just remember with you, run it drunk, running through the loop, like okay, Mona Lisa, <laughs> victory of the Samatrox, okay, and, and just running. Finish to Milo, we found her yeah. down in the basement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there and she is, running. no arms. Okay, <laughs> yeah, 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 just go keep, keep moving. We got fifteen minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's my experience Drunk. with you. Yeah, that's and I my know what people are thinking. Oh, you didn't have enough money for food, but you had enough money right. for beer. Yes, yes, that's what alcoholics <laughs> do. That you were correct. Yeah. yeah. And your point is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I've gotten into going out to small museums, like mm-hmm. the little local in small towns, and I'm sure all small towns all over the country do it, but in New Mexico especially. Uh, they do every little town has a, a city museum and yeah. it's usually open just a couple days a week. And it's just somebody local volunteers locally put things out there in the museum. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm always fascinated by what people choose, <laughs> what <laughs> objects people choose to represent themselves and their communities. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Because, For um, all eternity, cause that's the whole right. idea. It's right. This is preserved right. now. And, and, you know, they'll usually be, uh, I think they're just more nostalgia, like just nostalgia for people from the town, but they'll have the right. high school yearbooks yeah, and the, ba- uh, the, almost all of them have the same stuff, uh, band uniforms, <laughs> like old band <laughs> uniforms from the seventies. Uh, usually there's a doll collection. Some old, <laughs> old oh, lady boy. has donated yeah. her doll collection. Uh, then they'll have the military uniforms from world war one and world war two, mm-hmm. two. They always mm-hmm. have that. And out here, they always have, they almost always have a, an iron lung, remember, for tuberculosis. Really? I'd like they to see be, that. <laughs> I know. I, I know. would like to see that. Uh, because you can't get rid of an iron lung, I guess. Right. What <laughs> do you do time. with it? Yeah. It's so How heavy. How big are they? Is it, is, it, is it really small? I mean, like, is it right up on your shoulders? The no, you, about would it, go, you would go into the chamber. You know, you geez, would go into the chamber. I know, but it, how tight is it in there? I think it's pretty. It's like getting an MRI or something now. Oh, a scan Jesus! Now. And people would have to spend yeah. a lot of time in there, right? Right, right. That's when oh. your lungs, your lungs have collapsed due to TB. Oh, um, would yeah. you be able to get out, or would you have to stay in there? I thought <laughs> just looking at. I don't think you could let yourself out. It's not like a tanning booth or something. Um, but do you get? Do you have to be in there all the time? Just until your lungs inflate again, I think. Is what it oh is. Oh my fuck! Oh yeah, God. yeah. That's but there were a lot horrible. of them out here because all of, you know, everybody used to come out to New Mexico to get over TB tuberculosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you'll find those iron lungs the dry, all over the place. Dry air. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then without fail, each of these. And this is what I find fascinating. Each of these museums will have something truly amazing in them. Like if you if you go around looking in there, you will There's find one something. thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty and, cool. And an example is in uh, Dimming, New Mexico. We went to the city museum. Same thing. World War One uniforms, band uniforms, Your the books, doll collection, the yeah. the iron lung. And then you go into a room, and it's it's like a world class collection of uh, membrous pottery, 
and the members were like a priest, you know, people who lived out here about a thousand AD and amazing pottery. Now, most of that pottery was looted from graves of the right. members. Right. Which, which brings up other, yes. you know, ethical problems, which we'll discuss yes. on another episode. Yes. But uh, some rancher had found all of these members graves on his property and he basically grave robbed them. And, mm -hmm. but then he donated this huge collection of members po uh, pottery wow. to the Deming was, Museum. So yeah. Was it in ahead. good shape? Was it like, you know, was it just shards or were there actual pieces? No, full, full on pottery. And usually, you know, it, it was a funeral pot because they would put a, a kill hole, meaning that they would, take a pot, pop a hole in it, and then put that usually over the person's face when they were burying them to let their spirit out or oh for whatever. God. We don't really know. But you could usually tell if a pot has just a little tiny nickel-sized or quarter-sized hole in it, it was probably from a grave that it was- So uh, they put the hole over their mouth or something? Or like- No, what, what, it, it just pop it in there and then put the bowl over over their their face. For it. like Weird. we do when like putting oh, like a like, bowl, uh -huh. yeah, like putting like coins on somebody's or, or eyes. Coins. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna put uh, coins on your eyes. When you die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What kind of coin do. you want on there? I don't know. Maybe you a, want token. a euro, a token, <laughs> a, a subway token. <laughs> no, uh, from David those... Buster's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. I'll get you two of those. You got it. You got it. Just an arcade token would fit me. <laughs> you got it. Uh, but yeah, so it's just, it's amazing to me. Like I say, without fail, you, that's what happens. You go in, yeah. you're like, oh, th just when you're about ready to think this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is like, like a garage sale. Uh, right. You'll, you'll find something amazing in there. That's so. yeah. That, and that's really, well, I know for, uh, the show we worked on quick draw on Hulu, uh, we did a bender, uh, a, a, a mm. show about the benders, these famous or not very famous, but they were real, uh, uh, killers, murderers, serial killers yeah. in Kansas. Yeah. And you and I both grew up in Kansas and that's why the yeah. show was set in Kansas. And you, I don't know if I was ever there. I don't know if I ever saw it, but I knew of it. And you yeah. had been to the Bender museum, yeah, the museum, right? That's where my grandparents, <laughs> my grandparents would take, take all of us over there <laughs> as kids. They, they'd run out of things to do, you know? So they'd right. be like coming out of Parsons, Kansas. They'd be like, Oh God! What do we? You know, after a couple of days, they're kind of like bring them to the benders, really, take them to the Bender Museum. You know? Yeah, which was all about how these serial killers would kill people back in the 1870s. Yeah, but, and they had it all set up how they did it. Yeah, apparently they had a panel in the kitchen, and they would remove the panel and hit the hit the person yeah. from behind. Yeah, and then yeah, a tunnel uh, going out to the orchard so nobody could see when they took the body, dragging out, the but, body. Wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah, we did. Uh, my mom made us do. I don't know how many Native American <laughs> museums my mother made us go to growing really? up, and all yeah. kinds of crazy. She always, always the museum, the museum, the museum. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Uh, what, what's interesting about museums, though, is that, uh, and and also with archaeology, is that museums are trying to convey something about history or something about culture through objects, yes, through material culture. And unlike a text where the creator of the written book or document can tell us exactly what they were thinking, right? Uh, you objects can't. You know what I mean? There's a lot of interpretation that goes into objects. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book, Do Museums Still Need Objects? Uh, a writer by the name of Stephen Kahn quotes the archaeologist Ian Hodder, who's a famous archaeologist. And Hodder said that there are problems with using objects to interpret culture or history compared with using text. And for example, he said that material culture, the meanings from material culture are practical and subconscious, whereas meanings in speech and writing are linear. So again, hmm. it's like when a museum displays an object or when we look at an object and we try to tell something about the person that owned that object or that made that object, hmm. it there's a lot of conjecture yes. <laughs> that, that goes it's into that. It's subjective with a capital S. <clears throat> right, right. But, I mean, isn't that true about reality in general? <clears throat> you know, we're constantly looking, uh, taking in reality with our senses, right? And it's right, all subjective. Right. Everybody's point of view is totally different. 
Um, and so in that sense, it is very human. Uh, yeah. But I, I get the point that it, you can't then use it as a, a piece of science necessarily. Uh, well, yeah, to, there's problems. It's ambiguous, I guess, yeah, is what yeah. we would say. Because, <clears throat> again, if you look at a text, and this is kind of the difference between archaeology and and history as a as a, you know, as a science uh, is if, if you have if you look at the text the historical text, people can tell you exactly what they were meaning or exactly what they were thinking at that time. And that there's, you know, it's a little bit different when you try to interpret historical text compared to when you're looking at, you know, you just have a, a pot, for example, right, right. from 2000 years ago and trying to I figure agree. out. They're, they're both subjective, <laughs> but the, but the text is, is definitely less. Yeah. And and Hodder also says, you know, it's another thing for, uh, you know, if you look at a collection of objects, a room full of objects, you have nowhere to begin to try to interpret what all those objects mean or what mm-hmm. they say about the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas at least with a text, you have a beginning and an end. So you, you have some place where you could, you know, at least get a starting point to try to figure out what this person was trying to say. Agreed. And and the thing he he says that the real problem is though is that uh, you know these objects, for example, these artifacts that we find at archaeological sites, they actually last longer than the spoken word. Oh, yeah. So usually, <laughs> so usually those are the only things we have. Right, because paper burns up. <clears throat> Libraries right. burn down, man. Yeah. But pottery lasts forever. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and also, I mean, we don't have what people say, you know, 2000 years ago when you find it like an old pot or an old like fetish, you know, like a little object of a carving of an animal. You don't know what people were thinking about or talking about when they made that. Right. Uh, because the spoken word didn't last or we didn't have a way to keep the spoken word back then. Well, I know. So. I mean, it all comes from mainly. <laughs> I knew you were bringing it up. I knew you were going to bring it up. Uh, The other thing is context. And, you know, archaeology, everything's about context. So if you find something uh, on a site, most archaeologists are really uh, big on, like, documenting where it was, where it was in relation to other things. Because the context gives you that just having an object doesn't really tell you as much as seeing mm-hmm. where the object was when you when you discovered it. If you find a stone roll and it's near where all the poop is, you know it was a toilet paper holder or there's a good chance <laughs> right, right. that it was exactly. a prehistoric toilet toilet paper even though the toilet paper's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know it's uh <laughs> exactly you need context. There's there's actually a cave out here uh in the Sandia Mountains. It's called the Sandia Cave. And uh, people have been going there for probably 10,000 years going into Mm. the Sandia cave. And the guy who originally excavated, I don't know, it was back in the 30s or 40s, I think. uh, He just went in, just started digging around. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he was trying to make all of these uh, uh, theories and hypotheses about like animals and humans, you know, prehistoric extinct animals and humans all living together at the same time. And people were like... you just, we have no idea, you know, yeah. because you just dug you in there. it all up. Yeah. So, of course, it's going to look like they all lived at the same time <laughs> because you jumbled it all together. <clears throat> um, he, like, shovels stuff up into a pile and goes, look. <laughs> they were all together. They, they were, were all, all together. together. Well, yeah, but hmm. that's so funny. But yeah. you got to start somewhere. You can't blame those early guys too much. No, you got to no, start I, somewhere. I, I mean, don't, archaeology but... is so new, right? Yeah. That's the thing yeah. you've taught me. Yeah. That's like the about crazy thing about it. Late 1800s really is That's when it, so it started. That's so amazing. Um, so John, I just want, years. That's so I know. crazy. And so, yeah, we're still figuring it out. But now I guess it's like medicine or something. You know, you realize now like, hey, yeah, context, don't, we, let's wash <laughs> the wound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't just spit in your hands and like rub the dirt off or something. But so why John, haven't uh, we found the monolith? That's the thing I still don't understand about archaeology. <laughs> it's out there. It's out okay. there. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, looking around your office right now, uh, 
what do you what do you think? Well, I mean, you're not in your office right now. But no. What do you think in your living room if someone were to see just this? Yes. And say this is John Lear's living room. What do you think they would say about you? They right would be now? shocked. They would. They <laughs> anybody who knows me would be shocked that this is my living room. Yeah. They yeah. would think that I'm a hoity-toity, uh, yeah. that that objects and art and color are the most important things in my life, and and things of and nice things, that right. luxurious things uh, are the most imp- that I'm a man of of luxury, a man of taste, yeah. um, uh, and I'm none of those things, as you well know. Right, um, right. They they would see that I'm I'm probably Jewish, which is true because there's a Hanukkah. Yeah. Happy late Hanukkah to everybody. So um, they can pull pull that they out. Could, that would be they can pull that out. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, but like for example, I'm looking at this book. Here's a uh, a book of, of drawings by Yoko Ono. Now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you would describe me as a fan of Yoko, Ono, <laughs> although I have become one. I, I'm a big fan of Yoko uh, Ono. I have, right, so. I have become yeah. a, a fan of Yoko Ono. I, my, up yeah. until, my, um, you know, marrying my wife, I uh, I thought Yoko Ono was just this <laughs> crazy person who yeah. ruined John yeah. Lennon. And uh, then I started looking into her art, and she did some crazy yeah, stuff, yeah. man. Some amazing things. Amazing things. That piece called Cut. Yeah, where she yeah. sits on the stage. Yeah, if if you've never seen it, go uh, go, go YouTube cut the, uh, the by Yoko yeah. Ono. It, that's cool. And and you know I because people always think that like she like John Lennon was bringing her in like he was the cool one. I think uh, I myself my own personal <laughs> yeah, opinion she, is that yeah she was the cool one. Yeah, like she was yeah. she was you know she, she was she doing cool stuff. And, yeah, yeah, I totally yeah. agree. She was thinking an entire. He was a pop singer and yeah. she turned him into something cooler i yeah. agree and uh, i always you know they talk about when she was like sit around and make everybody uncomfortable when she would go into the studio with him and and you look at cut and that was like part of her, her, thing. her whole she, thing like, performance yeah. art she liked to make people uncomfortable as a yeah. performance art piece so i always look at it like her going in there was like a performance art piece. Like she yeah. knew she was making everybody uncomfortable. And yeah. she would just, and that was like her art, you know? Yeah. So. Cause it shook it up. It, it was yeah. provocative. Yeah. I agree. I agree. But I'm looking around the room. I also have, um, there's some African sculpture. So people might think I'm African. There's, yeah. uh, you know, there's, uh, yeah, I don't see. Oh, well, there's a statue my dad had um that is personal but yeah that's it they'd find the bones of my dog so they know i'm a dog lover so that's good yeah Um, and so you but you could see if that was the only thing say for example two two thousand years from now someone excavated your house and found just that they would know nothing about me right (laughs) (laughs) that's what we're that's what we're doing. Like when we yeah. look at like just one up and now, you know, to take it even further, like pick out one object out of that room that you think would. Yeah. I'd would see really... a, a fancy um, a Chinese uh, nut tray that my wife, <laughs> and they would think that I'm Chinese and that I love nuts. Yeah. Um, they'd be right about the nuts. I do like a yeah. mixed nuts. I'm a, I'm a mixed nuts guy, but it's, it doesn't, yeah. it's not, it's not the thing that defines me. Right. <laughs> but but that again it just gives you an idea of how difficult it is to draw conclusions from material culture from objects yep and uh well, well and, done <laughs> and the other thing is when it comes to museums uh you know the idea of when a museum curator or a museum selects a particular object mm. and chooses to display it we're mm. automatically giving significance to that object. Right. We're automatically, whether or this not it was. finds an entire society. Right. Right. And, you know, that's, again, when I talk about, uh, if you look at, try to think of like, why are they exhibiting this? Is it, is it because it was an example of everyday life? Mm-hmm. Or is it, an, is it something that was unusual at the time? It's special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like and the then, Hanukkah you know, that I showed. It just comes out once a year, but it happens to be here right now. Right, right. And if if somehow somebody were to find it at this time period, they would think, oh, these people were very, very religious. Devout, they had this. <laughs> Boy, would yeah. they be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we can 
barely get the candles in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but again, and, and also, you know, when you have a museum exhibit, it's it's telling a story with objects, basically. Mm. And, you know, uh, if you think about all the thousands of decisions that are made, you know, like what objects should we put out to tell this story about culture, about history, and even about the uh, how we display the object in a museum right. also right. changes people's interpretation of it. Are, are we, is it in the, is the object, say, for example, a bowl, is it in a case with a bunch of other bowls? In mm-hmm. which case you automatically think that they're, they, you know, it's not as significant or is it in a bowl by itself, you know, mm-hmm. for, or I mean, is it in a case by a itself, case by with, itself. That, with a spotlight on it? To You're basically it- talking about merchandising, you know, <laughs> really. It is. It and is. Uh, I did a, a pilot for um, Macy's. They wanted to do a show set in Macy's in the Herald oh, really? Square one in New York City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, it, we we went out there and 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 I started to learn a little bit about merchandising and you always think you know about merchandising yeah, you know you yeah. know that you put things here and it attracts you. there's a whole world there are people a hell of a lot smarter than us <laughs> oh, <no>. ge- ge- <clears throat> forcing us to buy what we think we want yeah you yeah. know what i mean like there's a whole science to it and it's so fascinating. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Where right. you place things, how you display things affects how we think about them and and where our attention is drawn. Right. And how that affects our culture, because we're thinking, well, if it's in a museum, it must be yeah. culturally significant. And it's the same um, in a grocery store. If it if it's an end cap, it usually means, oh, this is something that could be on sale or that's very right. important or new. And I yeah. should check it out. You know, yeah. Honestly, I I was just <laughs> because it's almost Christmas. We were out shopping yesterday. I never look at the end caps. I wandered all over looking for cream cheese, and they had stuck it on an end cap. Yeah, but well, you cap, must I scan would... the world slightly differently than most people because <laughs> they know what they're doing. It's like um, going to the um, to, to Vegas. Yeah. You know, you realize you're being ushered through the casino by people who are way smarter than you. Right. And right. you're being manipulated by them. Yeah. Uh, and you, you know, can't with, stop. You can't stop. You, can't. you feel it. You, feel it. you, you think stop. you're choosing to go over to this craps table, but it's you being guided there. It's yeah. like a video game where you think it's, <laughs> you know, uh, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and also just as far as museum go, you know, like I say, when I work security, I knew that if you put a stanchion, meaning a row some stands and a rope around an Hell artwork. Yeah. People now would automatically go, automatically go to that artwork first. Yes, they come in or like yes. spend more time in front of that artwork. Yes, because, yes, because the museum director is telling you this is important. Right, right. You want to get a we crowd bring around a, st- a piece of artwork. <laughs> we should bring a stanchion with us wherever we go and just set it up and see what happens. Yeah, God, it reminds right. me. It reminds me of when you talked about. Uh, you told me about when you were busking and and. Like street yes. performing. Yes. You we, know, there's a whole art to it of getting people yeah. to come up. I mean, look, you can just sit there and juggle or play a guitar uh, with a bowl in front of you and you're yeah. going to get a few bucks. But I'm talking about, no, I'm not talking about that at all. <laughs> I'm talking about bringing a crowd for a performance yeah. and then hitting them up for money. And it's, there's a whole science to it. You're absolutely right. And it's yeah. all, we would lay a rope down to create a stage, a performance space. We didn't need to, yeah. but we did. Yeah. And so people would come up to the rope, yeah, you know, because they'd want to see it. And now suddenly you've got people standing and then you have them scream or you have them chant. Yeah. And now yeah. you've got 200 people. You do a five minute show <laughs> and then you, you immediately, if there's a bunch of you, you all move to different areas with your hat out yeah. in their yeah. face. Uh, there's a whole yeah. there was a whole thing to it whole thing but it's something about the rope and seeing a crowd already around it yes you know, and that everybody stops everybody it's at national parks are the same way like somebody yeah. stops to look at a moose and then uh-huh. suddenly there's a crowd around the moose you know absolutely like, why, why is everybody out there we got to go out there and see it as well there was a coyote in the park uh the, yesterday morning 
And I saw really? a few people looking over there. And I'm like, what the fuck are they looking at? And so yeah, I looked yeah. over and I'm like, oh, it's a coyote, which is not, you know, yeah. a major thing. But they were uh, probably tourists and hadn't seen it. And then suddenly more people are like, what are they all looking at? What are they all? We're all <laughs> yeah, looking at a coyote, yeah. <laughs> which is, a you know, a daily experience. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <laughs> in an article for artsy.net called How Long Do You Need to Look at a Work of Art to Get It? <laughs> Isaac Isaac Kaplan notes that studies have shown that uh, people usually spend between 15 and 30 seconds looking at a piece of art in an art museum. Yeah. And I can attest it, to that as being yeah. a guard and spending a lot of time looking at people. It's they just come through, like do the old head nod, <laughs> go on to the because next Because I don't think, yeah, I mean, it's art, is art really supposed to be experienced that way? I mean, the art that I have in my house, I live with. Yeah. And so I experience it throughout my life, you know, I'll see. And, right, and, and right. when Jennifer moves the art, it makes you experience it different. That's why she does it. I mean, you know, yeah, so you experience yeah. it differently because of the color of the wall it's on or where it is or the light and all of that stuff. Right, right. It takes yeah, it's time. Been, yeah, and like you were saying, that piece of art behind you, when you first saw it, you didn't like it. And then it's, I, it's amazing, I think. It but, is amazing. Uh, but at first, I, it wasn't that I didn't like it. I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know why it was so right, that it was right. so good. It's worth a lot of money. Well, apparently, one of the things one of the things uh, about working at art museums is usually as a guard because the guards are like on the you know front edge. They're that they yes. the sphere as far as answering questions. Yes, uh, is that we would get like private tours just for the guards before a show open with the curators. That's cool. and they and they always described it as you know in traditional art. Uh, you would have a, a subject matter. You'd a actually have, like, they would do a painting of a, you know, landscape, or you do people together or something. So they were telling a story in the artwork using a very linear uh, mm -hmm. type of, you know, medium, I guess you would say. Yeah. And, but whereas modern art is trying to tell that same idea, that same drama and conflict through mm -hmm. shape and through color and composition. Yeah. Yeah. But you're still trying to get like that, all those colors where people are like, oh, I could do that. It's like, I don't know if you could do that, really. Yeah. And you if know you it. could, you should have, because yeah. now it's been done. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you didn't do it. But somebody say, did. And yeah. They, were, they did it before you thought of doing it, because you never did until you saw it. You right. Dummy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I heard that a lot. I heard that a lot. I could do that. You know, everybody always says that. It's like, yeah. I don't know. Uh, the other thing, you know, it's very hard when you're guarding a show that's very unpopular. <laughs> that was always hard too. Really, because, like what? Uh, what? What was an unpopular one that comes to mind? Uh, well, you know, the O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe is also. It's not only about George O'Keefe, but it's also the only museum for modern uh, American modernism. Mm -hmm. So they would Maybe have more? show. Yeah, like yeah, like that. Oh, it just boy. all anything starting about nineteen twenty on. Okay. So one one time they did a show on the Ashcan school, which were <laughs> like some painters that were like in the twenties and thirties. And it was amazing show. Amazing. Like it was all Ashcan, but no Georgia O'Keefe's. <laughs> so so people so people would come in. They're coming to the Georgia O'Keefe uh, museum. Right, right. And uh <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so they're like, "What the hell?" Yeah, Where like, who are, are these? Are these people? Yeah, who are these people? You know, oh, damn I know it. Um, and it was just tough. It was like, but intellectuals loved it. Art art historians loved it because it was a, you know the only time you could see that many Ashcan school paintings together. But yet, right. yeah, most people they wanted O'Keeffe's. You know, yeah. so you, you, they didn't know their audience. <laughs> they didn't yeah, they screwed up. Audience. The museum yeah. screwed up. Yeah. You gotta have a, you gotta, you gotta have a few of them. And if it's the O'Keefe Museum, you gotta have right. a couple of them in there. Right, right. But they would, you know, now I think they, they always keep like a permanent exhibit of some of Good, yeah. You there. gotta do that, you dummies. Bit. But, but it was tough being the guards for that because yeah. <laughs> you were taking all the just people just mad, angry. Yeah. Um, 
They should have leaned trapped. some up outside in the parking lot or something. <laughs> yeah, just a van, a moving van. To have them set <laughs> just up a few. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they do with the rugs out at the, uh, the parking lot of uh, exactly, or just have people walking around holding them, <laughs> <laughs> like the sandwich board. Yeah, have one on the yeah, front, one we, on they the back. should have put them on you guys. Oh, they should have scotch tape a, cu- a couple to your back. <laughs> Turn around, let me see. I want to see. Or this. wear one on your head, like with those beer, <laughs> those beer mug cups. You know that people yeah. put on their head. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. You should be. Thank you. You are a museum be, guy. I, you are uh, a museum. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> so, John, uh, our word "museum" actually comes from the Greek "musa," uh, which meant Meaning muse. Moose. moose. <laughs> which because uh, moose me, mooses stand still, so you can look at them. That's the uh, really? that's where it all comes from. Yeah, <laughs> really. Did you see really? him? The moose, yeah. moose see him? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, museum actually means uh, seat of the muses. So it was like as the muses were the goddesses of like literature, science. Yeah, sit down for a second so we can look at you. <laughs> right? <laughs> muse, yeah. Muses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then. Or is and then it their it also, butt? Or is it talking about oh their God. ass? Oh, God. You, you are know, marketing. muses have a sweet <laughs> round butt on them. At least you have to. <laughs> you have spent a lot of time in there. What museum were you at? <laughs> we're going to have to do... I want to do a show sometime on... Uh, is it art or is it pornography? Because that's oh. what everybody will do an, an entire episode on that. Because love that it, you yeah. got to bring graffiti into that one, yeah, uh, yeah, too. Because people, it's so funny to talk about graffiti with people. Yeah, they just they just paint themselves into an idiot corner <laughs> whenever they talk about it. Yeah, yeah, it's vandalism. Uh, okay, now I'm going to ask you a second question. <laughs> yeah, what if it isn't to you? Uh, yeah, right. and then you get into what is art, and then you're fucked. Once you yeah. get into what is art, you're screwed. Yeah, it's it's one of those like like you talk about with modernism too. Is once you start doing, you got to do research before you just write it yeah. off. You know yeah. what I mean? I would. Yeah. I was always not really into graffiti art, and then uh, oh, I love it. I think MTV hired me to do uh, write an episode for something years ago, uh, and it was all about a graffiti artist in in new york so what yeah. what do i do i just it was a animated show i don't think it ever went but um i just researched i researched yeah. that's what i do you know so i yeah. researched a bunch of graffiti history of graffiti art and graffiti art and uh same thing it's like i i really respect it really admire yeah. it I, I, yeah you know i mean like anything there's bad hmm. graffiti art and then yeah. there's there's people who don't and then there's amazing stuff and the concept yeah. of like bringing your surroundings back the urban surroundings right. back where you're inundated with billboards screw yeah. you you know yeah. you're you know this is my neighborhood these these walls that these companies put up you know screw that they're ugly yeah. and and you know i'm taking they, so there's a whole world like anything there's yeah. a whole world and god there's some i love it yeah i'm like yeah too. that's a blank wall put color on there yeah I love murals. I love, yeah. It's and I love same that, thing it's, with that it's dangerous. And I just, there's every, I love it. I just yeah. love it. Yeah. Uh, in the 15th century, they started using the term museum to refer to uh, Lorenzo de' Medici's collection of art and objects. Mm. And, and, oh, then by the, <laughs> and then by the there 17th century, uh, museum was being used to basically describe a um cabinet of curiosities uh-huh. meaning just you know rich guys would go out and they would just collect shrunken everything. head in there here's my shrunken yeah. head here's my mm-hmm. here's my tarantula right. right right and uh it would be everything so you would have yeah like you say you'd have some botanic some real scientific things but you also would have some fake things in it, or maybe not. Maybe you didn't know they were fake, or maybe right. you would have a piece of art by Da Vinci right next to the a shrunken head peacock, that you were talking. Or, yeah, yeah, 
That's hmm. the thing. A museum of natural history is always just bizarre. Those are the craziest ones. <laughs> when you get down in the basement and see, and the, and the way yeah. they 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 taxidermy animals and put them in these little dioramas, oh, it's so oh. bizarre. Yeah, yeah. I don't How, know. That I, was that was really big, like in the early 1900s. And now mm-hmm. I know you see an original one, and they're not aging well. No, <laughs> they're not aging no. well. Then. Did that cheetah's yeah. jaw fall off? <laughs> why, why is, was he always wearing a sweater? You know, was, why, why didn't they put that on him? Uh, and so in the museum, uh, their book called Museum and Gallery Studies, The Basics, Rian and Mason, Alistair Robinson, and Emma Cofield note that our concept, our modern concept of museums actually started with these private collections of aristocrats Makes and sense. wealthy people. Who else and, had time to do that? <laughs> Everybody know. else is working. I know. You hear what well, Lord Valdehorp is doing? Yeah. He's, he's yeah. putting things in glass boxes. What? Anyway, yeah. I got go to go milk the cow. <laughs> keep from getting typhoid or something. Yeah. You know? We're trying yeah. to sit, eating grass and this guy's collecting all this. Well, you always think about those him. naturalists and uh, who would like, you know, butterfly collections, those, yeah. those British. Yeah. Oh, I found a swallowtail, you know. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I killed it and put it in, <laughs> put it on a board. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, to me, it's like, and they did it just for it, the the idea was the collection was supposed to say something about the collector more than yeah. anything. Yeah. So, like, show that he was a man of the Enlightenment, and I say man at this time because usually these were no men at yeah. that time. Well, that's true for me too because my beer can collection says a lot about who I am. <laughs> I was, you know, I was going to bring up, it's like when you go over to somebody's house and they want to show you their Star Wars collection or, yeah. their, or their beer can collection, yeah. you know. Do you collect anything? What do you collect? You collect books, right? But not I really. I I would, I used to collect, but I used to have, but I got broke and sold all my <laughs> really good books. Uh, now I just have a ton load of books for this podcast. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I collect anything. Yeah, I'm trying to think like, if I do too. Or, I don't um, either. I, yeah. I collect bills. I have bills. I have a lot of bills that I collect. I file them away and I keep them nice. Yeah, you I can't ever, think of anything. Have you ever been to somebody's house where they want to show you their collection? You're yes. kind of like, oh, yes. oh well, yeah, I don't, here I don't we know. go. Well, this yeah, is the from Star Wars. People are the me. I, I mean, I love Star Wars, but when you go into yeah. a room and it's just got all of these, <laughs> you know, Star Wars things, I'm just like, really, I'm worried about you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then it, it, you try to be polite, and then try to give some hints that like maybe we should get back to the party. <laughs> it's always like it's you so never true. get it. You never get it. A lot know. of men collect watches and guitars. Have oh, you noticed yeah. that? Or yeah. pens, pens like fancy yeah. pens, watches, yeah. pens, and guitars. It's so bizarre. You only right. need one of each. <laughs> With the watches the watch i do know some people who collect watches yeah. you don't even need yeah. watches and pens you know those fancy yeah. pens never work yeah i don't know yeah. yeah and guitars it's just weird uh in an article called cabinets of curiosities and the origin of collecting sotheby's auction house did i say that right sotheby's yeah, sotheby's, <laughs> sotheby's, sotheby's, Sothe- sotheby's 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 uh, says, quote, imagine a world without telephones, TVs, computers, and phones. How would you entertain your guests without the aid of any of these devices? Cabinets of curiosities were the aristocrats' answer for those who sought to enliven the opulent but dimly lit parties thrown during the Italian Renaissance. Okay, I get that. Yeah. You got yeah. nothing to talk about. Let's go look over here at my shrunken heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Hey, but once we get done with dinner, I got something to show you guys. <laughs> uh, and they also say that, you know, these cabinets of curiosities were ways for rich guys to pick and choose what objects they wanted to display to create their own subjective meanings of the world. So again, you were the curator of your own museum, basically, of your uh-huh. own collection. And you would just put things in there to prove what you already wanted. wanted. See, now, this is why the world is flat. <laughs> yeah, take a look See? at this. Look yeah. at this. Uh-huh. Uh, and you know, there were famous people that had them, uh, these cabinets of curiosity. There was a guy named John Gardner Tradescant. 
who was a collector in the 1600s, and he had a huge cabinet of curiosities. And Tradescant, he left it to his friend Elias Ashmole. Oh and I'm boy, sure his friend. What an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> oh, yeah, Here I'm comes sure. Ashmole. <laughs> oh boy. But can you imagine? Like, I'm sure it was like, oh God, <laughs> he left me what? You know? <laughs> yeah. Be like, like uh, somebody leaving you all their junk, you know? Well, that's like when you kick, I'm gonna have to come to your house and <laughs> you know, Mary, if Mary goes down first and then you kick, somebody's yeah. gotta go clean. Who's gonna do it? Me and your brother. The share the share shed. <laughs> we go gotta go through. And, you know, I, I remember when yeah. we were going through my dad's apartment after he died, we we were just c- kind of taking his files out and we we're going to just yeah. toss yeah. them, recycle them. And out of one of the files, a $20 bill came, flew out. <laughs> and then my brother and I looked at each other and we're like, God damn it. Yeah. Now we've got to yeah. go through every goddamn file. And sure enough, <laughs> he What's stuck money, money, little, little, you know, he didn't have any money, but you yeah, know, you, can, yeah. you don't want to throw it away, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was, when my grandfather passed away, uh, there was a, I don't know where it came, but they were like, you know, he left a hundred dollar bill hidden out in the garage in case of emergencies. <laughs> And I think he just said that because like, right. and, and so you'd see like, you know, as the house and people are there for the funeral, I'm going to go outside just to get some air. <laughs> and then you see them all heading over there, all Check heading over there to the garage, you know, for a hundred bucks. Even at the time, it wasn't that much money. Yeah, if you're at a funeral and you're bored, it's like your curiosities. Hmm. You're going around yeah. looking at uh, <laughs> something to do. Uh, but anyway, Ashmole. Uh, took that collection, <laughs> took that collection, and donated it to, or Oxford University in England bought that collection, and that mm. became the Ashmolean Museum. Which <laughs> opened- the Ashmolean <laughs> Museum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. I want a shirt that says <laughs> Ashmolean. Uh, and then also wow. Thomas Jefferson was supposed to have at Monticello. Uh, mm-hmm. he was supposed to have something he called his Indian Hall. Oh boy. Which, <laughs> yeah, oh boy. Which was just full of a bunch of bunch of stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus. That. Would not go over well today. Right. Yeah, uh I'm sure. And then and then, you know, after that whole idea, they began to open up those cabinets of curiosities to the public and let people come in and look at them and charge money for them. Uh and then they became like popular museum, like P. T. Barnum's American Museum. Opened oh in New York City in 1840, yeah, and it cost a dime to enter. So they, I think, they uh-huh. call these like dime museums. Uh, and in the the book or an article called "The Legacy of Dime Museums and the Freak Show: How the Past Impacts the Present," Katie Stringer yes. says that uh, these museums contained many artifacts, which right. like real artifacts, and also gaffes, g a f f e s, which were faked items made to trick the viewer. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. So now it's, and, <clears throat> and, and once you go down that road, what is real and what isn't, right. I, I guess right. is your whole point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, that I remember seeing like at, um, Oh, at the, the, uh, the, the rodeo or not the rodeo, but the cattle show in Kansas where everybody yeah. would come to buy cattle. I don't know how it works, yeah. but you would come yeah. and bid on bulls and stuff anyway. And there were all these curiosities around it. And there was one that said the biggest bull in the world, <laughs> a giant yeah. bull. Yeah. And you would go yeah. into this room and they played with perspective and you would really, climb the, did you ever go to that thing? At no, the, um, no, no, no. American so you Royal would, or something? At the American Royal. And it would yeah. and you'd climb these stairs around it and look down on it. And the way it was all set up, it looked like it was giant. And it was a big bowl. But it wasn't like, you know, but it looked yeah. like the size of a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Wow. But but again, it uh you know, he would also exhibit, and this where is where you start getting into questionable things, where he would exhibit uh like human humans as well, you know. Jesus. So you had like, uh, well, you know, that was uh, what was on Monticello in the Indian Hall. Oh, it was just like, yeah, here yeah, are something. the scalps, right, and the skulls, yeah. and yeah. Uh, so you had General Tom Thumb, which was a you know he was a person with dwarfism. Yeah, uh, 
P.T. Barnum also had the Aztec twins who were albinos. And then mm-hmm. he had something that was marketed as, what is it? And it was a person with microcephaly. Oh. So so it was essentially you had some real objects mixed with yeah. w- with basically a freak show. Yeah. And uh, generally, and then other people took that and they tried to like take the you know freak show on the road and people were right. trying to make money right. from it. And they would almost always label it as being educational and scientific, I think, to make people <laughs> feel better about going in and, and to looking To gawk at it. it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Stringer says what's interesting, she says, by labeling a person a freak, the sideshow removed the humanity of the performer because he or she might not have the same physical characteristics of the normal person and authorized the paying customer to approach the person as an object of curiosity and entertainment. Yes, because yeah. we are 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 hmm. are have evolved to value pattern. Pattern yeah. is a big part of the way we survive. I, I you right. know I found the the fish here. I'm going to come back and find my way back. Yeah. You know all that. Yeah. And 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 so when something is outside of the pattern, right, it, right. it really fascinates us because it puts us into like, well, well then what is it? Like it's it, it, I, I have to somehow class of anyway we can't not look at it right right and it's and it's it's you know different so, we have to find hmm. diff- when we find difference we're just we're programmed to find pattern but we're, but because of that the flip is we're programmed to find difference yeah and become intrigued or like it's like important attracted to it yeah we got to find out why that's different mm-hmm. um so anyway on the other side of that, coming out of those same cabinets of curiosities, you had legitimate museums or, you know, you had your big art museums came out of that yeah. same, same history. So one path was to go into freak shows and yeah. like P.T. Barnum's right. uh, American Museum. The other one was to go into actual museums. And right. so you had, uh, uh, you know, again, in the 1700s, people opened up these private collections and started charging money for them. In the 1753, the British Museum was established by Parliament, and that was the first truly public museum in the world. Hmm. Uh, and then after the French Revolution in 1789, the French government, uh, the revolutionary government, took the King's Palace of, of the Louvre and turned that into right. an art museum. Right, which we sprinted so, through drunk. Hmm. Yeah. Little did they know, <laughs> all of I their do. work would culminate in two fucking messed up yeah, drunks yeah. with long hair, unshaven and, and unbathed. <laughs> God, we were horrible. Yeah. We were a menace to that country. Uh, yeah. Hungry, hungry. And- hungry, broke, filthy, yeah. no rhyme or reason, drunk. What were we doing? <laughs> I don't know. It was fun um, until we got to Paris. That Paris was rough. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Ugh. being on the bridge, both of us like hung over, drunk, and staring up at a beautiful moon over the Notre Dame and just realizing we were with each other and broke. Yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a romantic. It wasn't a romantic. No. No. Yeah. Like, let's go back to the hostel. We should go back. Let's go back. Let's go on let's a trip go- together. That would be fun. That would be. Wouldn't that we be could- fun? Let's make it an episode. Let's make it an episode. Yes. God, that'd be great <laughs> to go back. Let's retrace our steps. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea of opening, in a, opening up these museums to the public, the idea was, uh, first of all, if you had a national museum, then the, the government wanted to create this shared sense of nation. Yes, people. of course. And the other thing was the idea that if you let different social groups see each other, uh, it would promote acceptable uh, modes of behavior. Or in other words, you get rich people and poor people all together in a museum, and then the the poor people will be brought up, basically. Ah, to, I see. Yeah. To behave they, properly. Right. They would be social emulation there. Uh, so museums, so the governments actually saw museums as social spaces by which governments could civilize, improve, and educate their populations. And okay. that's from Mason yeah. and Robinson. Uh, so again, I don't know. I remember as a kid, 
when they would take us to the Nelson Atkins Art Museum in Kansas City, oh, the old trip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I had to walk through that thing again, I'd want to kill myself. You knew you were done when you got into it the, because they had the biggest Chinese collection yeah, yeah. in the world. And it's like, yeah, that's, you know, the, everybody dumped their stuff there because it was just like, yeah. oh, <laughs> just yeah. always and always and always. And just in a group with a bunch of kids who were just Ugh. fidgety and not wanting to be there. And... I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> Yeah. With the, the suits of armor you'd be excited about the suits of armor and right. then it was like an entire day of just like i don't care just let, me <laughs> just let me go yeah the suits of armor were always cool because they were so small yeah you know, like god yeah. they were little remember <laughs> yeah. they were little five foot deep balls those nights your, now nowadays we could just even if, if yeah. it was a night you could just hold your hand out and keep him yeah. from like hitting you <laughs> But I would crush. We would destroy in that world. Yeah, you pick him up, putting him up under your arm. Okay, Lancelot. Okay, Lancelot. So somebody's upset. Yeah, what yeah. are you looking Ooh. for? What are you looking for? You <laughs> so. lost your lance. Okay, we'll find it. But I don't know. It's uh, I and I would always. Did you ever take your students when you taught? Did you ever have to go to the art museum and absolutely <laughs> do it as much as possible because it was the easiest day in the world. Yeah, because you yeah. get parents to come. Well, we uh, the schools that I taught at, the parents never come. But I remember we went to one um, museum where I took my fifth grade class, and I decided to get all of my roommates. Do you remember this? Yeah, all my I, roommates to do it. You did. You couldn't do it because you were working. But all my, yeah. you know, artistic roommates who were all broke and unemployed, and I brought the <laughs> bus full of kids by my apartment and went upstairs and got them all and got them to be. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's and brilliant. It was great. It was a great day. It really yeah. was. <laughs> all right, John. Well, I I feel like we've. We've talked about some stuff, some gaffes, some real stuff about museums, maybe some gaffes, some stuff that made you yeah, trick I people. Mean, I don't know. The only thing missing that I from uh, would I would love to hear maybe a, a story about you being a museum guard because you were a museum <laughs> guard. And that is such an int- you've had all kinds of interesting jobs. Yeah, I yeah. mean, Jesus, mm. you've, you've done every single weird job there could possibly be. But that a museum guard. So you're dressed up in an in a uniform, right? Right. Had a, a badge. Hat. Did and you have no a hat? Ma- no hat. Yeah. Oh, okay. But a badge and a but gun. But a badge. Uh, no gun. You you don't want guns in the museum because you'll take them from uh, you and shoot you. Well, no, you'll hurt the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> if you, but did you have any sort of taser or anything? Like, what if there was a, a heist? No, you, uh, and again, for most of the time, you would radio up to the center. If something really bad happened, you would radio to the main desk, mm-hmm. the main and, security and desk. they get the real people down they there. they get the real cops out there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. any, any other than people asking you questions or is there any sort of anecdote or memory that comes to mind? Well, I think, you know, it drives people crazy when you have, like when you hire guards to come in. Uh, people don't, people who take a guard job don't realize how long you have to be on your, your feet. Yes. And oh how, how painful that is, even though you're yes. not doing anything really physical, just standing on concrete for a on long time. Concrete or any hard surface. It is, yeah. that is rough. Yeah. And With the other thing. to take your mind off of it. Either. Right, you're just right. standing there. It's like, God, my feet hurt. Yeah. Who was it? It was Descartes that said all of humans problems arise from them not not being able to be alone in a room with their own thoughts yeah and you see that, that as a guard you would yeah. see and when you would watch the cameras you'd see some guards mm. just just losing their minds yeah. it should have you been know? i think therefore i'm tortured <laughs> yeah you know yeah. descartes should have that's a descartes yep. joke for you everybody <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, who's gonna where do you go to get descartes jokes come here where you come here um no i i think the what if, well, it's always the damn. You always, yeah, if someone says you're there to say, you know, please don't touch, 
Like yeah. A, like, you like, you say that a lot. hate that. If there's one thing people oh, hate is yeah. being told what to do because it's embarrassing. Yeah. And then they, yeah, then they have to, yeah. uh, so they would turn to you and say mean stuff. Oh, right. I know. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I like, make I'm not doing you. Do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was it. Uh, but I know uh, one time we, we noticed there was something on uh, one of the paintings because you, you know, the guards are down there with the paintings all the time. So something was something odd was on the painting. So we called our conservator, who was a great guy, uh, really funny, um, really smart. But he came out and he had this big eyeglass on to try to see what it was on there and <laughs> come to find out after, you know, like 10 minutes of looking at it, he's like, it's a piece of lettuce. It's a piece of <laughs> lettuce. So somebody, somebody had come into the museum after lunch and had sneezed and threw Coughed. a piece of lettuce onto oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> Humans are disgusting. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Yeah. And then they were embarrassed. They probably either didn't see it or they were embarrassed. Like, get the fuck out. Get the high. Yeah. I just, yeah. I just hocked up a piece of lettuce <laughs> on there. Yeah. Let's go. It let's go. Let's go. There. It dries oh. on there. Uh, and then the other thing, again, the guards, too. Like, one time we had this guard who uh, just like an accident prone guy, you know, really mm. nice guy, but just one of those guys that was kind of accident prone. And he was trying to teach a new guard why we don't allow coffee into the galleries. And so he, and, and so he had a, a coffee cup and he was trying to demonstrate what could possibly happen. Threw coffee on a painting. No! <laughs> yeah, so. Jesus Christ! Oh my God! So it was one of those like trying to say like, this is why we don't let them come in. And he actually did it. We're like, it. what are you doing? Holy what are you doing? Holy shit. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. I wonder if it was like, um, an inability to control his, his you know, like a in, uh, impulse, yeah, you know, yeah. like if it was just like he had, you know, like my, my wife was at a baker and uh, getting a, a cake for my son. And yeah, they yeah. handed the cake to her and a woman, a stranger next to her, stuck her finger in it. And the woman put it in her mouth and goes, I, I don't know what made me do that. Like it was just an impulse thing. Isn't that crazy? To me, that is insanity. That's why yeah. human beings deserve to. I mean, we just can't help ourselves. We're right, just, right. And we're that, just I think that's idiots. Why museums are starting to put a lot more things under glass, and people get yeah. mad. Like, well, why are you put? Well, that's why. I mean, because at yeah. least we're hocking you put it up under glass. lettuce, you dummy. <laughs> yeah, or you people are poking at it, thinking yeah, I gotta that touch it's, it. It's I like, want to touch the Mona Lisa. Yeah, I want the next. I want the next screen or something. You know? Oh right! <laughs> oh my god! That's so funny. <laughs> All right, John. Wonderful, wonderful job. This is uh, I, I'm, I'm and and Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, uh, we're we're coming out. We're coming to you Christmas Eve. We're sh- Christmas we're taping Eve. this, and uh, you're going to be hearing this on Christmas Day. So yeah, um, this will be a new tradition. New tradition. Yes. <laughs> Watch Intro to Anthro right when, after we open the presents. Yeah, <laughs> and then right. uh, and instead of the football game, hey everybody, yeah. how about listen to these guys? This or just during the commercials, mute the commercials <laughs> and listen to a little intro to Anthro every year, every Christmas. The new Christmas tradition, intro yeah. to Anthro. Well, Merry Christmas, my friend. You too, John. Uh, yeah. This is human number one, John McRae, and uh, human number two, John Lear, signing off. And thank you, everybody, for listening. If you found this podcast interesting, please tell a friend or uh, gift it to them for Christmas. There you go. It's free. (laughs) It's It's free. free. (laughs) All right, guys. Happy holidays. We love you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye.